I can still remember 20 years ago or more where people would say, you looked up the code on Google. You, you Googled how to do that script, right? And that's, that's cheating. You're like, no, that's being productive. That's being efficient, right? I don't know if you agree, but if I was, if I was starting out, AI would be like a big focus of mine. And the idea here is that you can go in and take a piece of malware and then open it up and analyze it and understand what it's doing and maybe even change it and make it do something else or do something more. If you're at all interested in privacy, you probably want to look at a encrypted privacy focused email solution. When I read books such as this one, Ethical Hacking, or How to Hack Like a Legend, or Linux Basic for Hackers, or Extreme Privacy, What It Takes to Disappear, fantastic book if you're really into privacy. There's an email solution that comes up time and time again, and that's Proton Mail. Not only that, but a lot of people I interact with in the cybersecurity space use Proton Mail. The whole idea with Proton Mail is that you want to keep your conversations private. Do you really want companies and others reading all your email? So if you're interested in keeping your conversations private, look at Proton Mail. They're based in Switzerland, where the privacy laws are a lot stronger than, for instance, in the United States. They provide end-to-end -end encryption, are trusted by many, many people out there. But for me, the big reason to look at Proton Mail is in books such as these, from respected authors such as Occupy the Web, who actually uses Proton Mail, and someone as famous in the privacy space, such as Michael Basil, talking about extreme privacy and discussing Proton Mail in his book, makes me believe that it's really, really good. We actually use Proton Mail and Proton VPN. I really want to thank them for sponsoring this video and supporting my channel and for making the world a more private place. Use my link below to sign up to Proton Mail and get a special David Bombal discount. Hey everyone, it's David Bombal back with the amazing Occupy the Web. OTW, great to have you back in 2024. Welcome. Thank you, David. It's always an honor to be back on your channel, the best IT and cybersecurity channel on YouTube. I appreciate you saying that. As I always say, you know, a big part of that is because of you. So thanks so much for sharing your experience with all of us. Big question for you is, you know, I want to get into hacking. I want to become like you. Do you have a roadmap? But just before you answer that question, I forgot to mention, anyone who hasn't seen our, uh, our previous videos, I've linked a whole bunch of them below. If you don't know who OTW is, you should by now. But if you haven't seen his work or watched his videos or read about him, this is a very famous book, number one, often on Amazon, Linux Basics for Hackers. Occupy the Web and I have created a series of videos where we go through this book, which I'll link below as well. And we'll hopefully complete that in the first part of 2024. I'm going to hold you to that, Occupy the Web. He's also, he's also written this book, Getting Started, Becoming a Master Hacker. And that's sort of what we want to do. So Occupy the Web, I'm really looking forward to your roadmap for this year. And another book which I really enjoy is Network Basics for Hackers, very close to my heart because of my background. Occupy the Web, I've been talking enough now. Over to you. Tell me if I want to get started in 2024, how do I become really, really proficient in cybersecurity or hacking, you know, give me a roadmap if you can. Okay, first of all, buy all my books. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that is a good answer. <laughs> I, I'm joking, of course, but uh, you know, a lot of what you need to know to get started in cybersecurity, those books were designed just for that purpose, right? They, I, I wrote them from my experience of training the US military and intelligence community where I was working with some really, really smart people and they were lacking in certain skills. And one of them that I noticed right away was Linux, right? Yeah. And so that's how, that's how the Linux Basics for Hackers book came about. So people write me and say, where do I start? Well, yeah. the place you start is with Linux. And you'll have seen David say it and I say it both and that yeah. you can't be a hacker without knowing Linux. Now, maybe you don't want to be a hacker. Maybe you just want to be a cybersecurity pro. And that's going to be equally true there. If you know Linux, you're way ahead of the game of most people who have limited their experience to Windows and Mac. Right? Because so many of the tools, both hacker tools and cybersecurity tools, are built in Linux. In addition, in almost every shop, right, in almost every shop, there's one Linux expert who's indispensable, who's indispensable. They can't 
operate without that person because nobody else knows Linux in that shop. And that person has guaranteed employment, right? <laughs> they, they can't let that person go because that's the only person in the shop who knows how to run all the Linux-based things. So if you want to make sure that you always have a job, make sure that you know Linux and some scripting, right? So my book, Linux Basics for Hackers, has a the final chapter in there is on Python scripting. It also has a chapter on bash scripting. And writing scripts is one of those basic skills that everybody should know in cybersecurity because it's going to make life so much simpler. You can run scripts that'll do the job over and over, whether you're an administrator or you're a hacker. You know, these scripts can can oftentimes they're just duplicating things that you can do manually, but doing them repetitively without human intervention. It saves you a lot of time and money. If it's saving you a lot of time and money, it's saving your employer a lot of time and money. And remember that the employer wants as much productivity out of you as possible. The more productive you are, the more valuable you are. So these scripting skills are really important. So both my Linux Basics for Hackers, which one of the reviews on Amazon said that the book is worth it just for the Python section, which yeah. is, I think it's like the final chapter. We also have a Python section in Getting Started Becoming a Master Hacker. I have a Python, both a, a Python Basics for Hackers and an advanced Python class coming up this spring, I think in April. So if you're with us, you can go ahead and do that. And we'll show you a lot of the uh, cybersecurity-based Python scripting, not in some hacking, some cybersecurity, but get you familiar with the tools and the modules and the libraries, primarily in Python, because Python is the scripting language of choice for cybersecurity, because it has so many modules and libraries that make your life much simpler. So yes, Go language is great. Rust is great, Bash is a necessary skill, but you really need to know Python first. And once you know Python, the other languages will fall in very quickly behind you, but get Python because about 80 to 90% of what we do in cybersecurity is Python. But you're seeing more and more people go into the Go language, Google's language, which I like a lot, and we'll be doing some Go language in the future. But right now, most of the stuff is written in Python, so master Python. So let's go back and, and talk about what you need to do. The first thing you need to do is you need to know what a computer is. <laughs> yeah, that, that might, I'm, I'm, I'm half joking, but you need to have some basic computer skills, right? You need to know, you know, how to turn the thing on, how to turn the thing off. You know, there's a, there's a, a um, a certification that CompTIA has is the A plus certification. Yeah. And that's a good certification to gather, you know, make sure that you have all of those basic skills down. So I would recommend that. I like the CompTIA certifications because they're vendor neutral. So what we're doing is that we're, we're teaching skills that can be used in any environment, no matter who the vendor is. CompTIA has an A+, plus. check that out, okay? And if you can master that, you've got the first step, okay? You don't have to do the search, right? You can just do the, inf you just get the information and learn what's in that, but it's not, it helps to have search just on your resume if you're starting, right? Exactly, right. So if you're trying to break into the industry, one of the things that you can do is to gather some certs, okay? Yeah. You don't have to get the certs. The certs cost money, right? So that's one of those things that you know, if you don't have the money, just learn what's in there. Take the practice test and make sure you understand all the information. You don't have to have the certification, but if you're trying to break into the industry, this is one of the things that people are looking for is, you know, do they have the certain certifications? A plus is kind of a base certification. This is, I have some basic, um, computer skills, oftentimes it's a it's in line with like a help desk position. Um, so if that's what you're looking for, those are the kind of skills that you need. The next area you need to be able to master is 
networking skills. You need to understand how networks work. And surprisingly, I run into a lot of students who don't have these basic networking skills. And yeah. that's what led to Network Basics for Hackers. Network Basics for Hackers is a book to give you, the first few chapters are just really fundamental networking stuff. You know, nothing too complex, just what you need to know as a very base. Things like, you know, what's an IP address, right? What is DNS? What are, what are, what's the OSI model? What are MAC addresses? What's ARP? These are the things that we try to cover in that book. And then in the later chapters, we go into some of the other protocols, okay, the, the, the other things like DNS and like SMTP, you know, email protocol, and show you how they work and then also where their weaknesses are. We also do a little bit there in some of the more advanced stuff like uh, SDR and what have you, and Bluetooth as well. So you need to know the basics of networking. So make sure you have those skills down, right? We obviously, I, ha I have that book and I also have, I have a set of videos on networking, network basics for hackers. So it's, are you talking about like Network Plus from CompTIA as well or perhaps CCNA? Because yeah. that gives you basic networking knowledge? I think both of those are good basic networking certifications is the Network Plus and the CCNA from Cisco. Those are good ones to get started with, right? To prove that you have the basic understanding and knowledge of networking. You don't have, you don't have to have the cert, but you know, you can study that material and make sure you master those skills. It always comes up, it came up last year. So I'm gonna ask you the question because I, I, I see all the feedback coming in. Uh, Network Plus, or CCNA, or both, or which one, which is the best, is, is the, or which one do I need if I want to become a hacker? It's always like that, right? Well, if you want to become a hacker, I don't think it really makes a whole lot of difference if you want to be a hacker. If you want to be a network engineer, I think CCNA is a little more valuable in yeah. that realm. So if that's the way you, your career path is going, CCNA is the way to start. You know, if you want to just prove that you have the networking skills, Network Plus. So that's that would be my recommendation. You need to have these basic skills in cybersecurity, in hacking, and which one you choose to do for hacking doesn't really matter. But if you if you're really looking to become a network engineer, I'd go the Cisco route, okay, versus the Network Plus route. I'll say this because people might not be aware of it: the Cisco. A lot of people struggle with CCNA because they find it really tough because it, it's quite a hardcore exam if you're just like brand new to it. So Cisco have created a new cert called CCST, which is like a technician exam. Um, gives you like more basic stuff. It's There's free training on Cisco's website um, and there's an exam that's online, it's cheaper. So you've got CCST for cybersecurity as well as um, networking. I obviously have a love for Cisco because of my background because I've done Cisco for many years. But um, yeah, my personal choice is always CCNA perhaps, but it's, I'm glad to get your opinion. And I, you know, it, it's like you said, you just get the basic knowledge, right? Yeah, you need to have that basic understanding. If you're not gonna become a network engineer, Network Plus is great, okay? Or the Cisco's, uh, if, you, if you really wanna go the network engineer route, then follow the yeah. Cisco route is probably the best way. Yeah. They, yeah. You know, people recognize them as being more valuable in the network engineer world, right? Yep. Cisco, Cisco is the 800 pound gorilla in yep. the networking world. So you might want to follow that path if that's where you're going. If you're going cybersecurity, you're going uh, hacking, it, I don't think it really makes a lot of difference. The next on my, on my list is going to be what I started off saying, that's Linux skills, right? You, you need to have those Linux skills and that's Linux Basics for Hackers. Right? That's my book. We have, we've, you and I have done uh, four of the chapters of that book. Uh, we'll be doing more in the future. Uh, there's like 10, I have 10 uh, tutorials on Hackers Arise. So not all of the book is on Hackers Arise, but most of it is, as well as our videos. So make sure that the book is not going to make you a Linux expert. It's going to give you the fundamentals that you can function inside of a Linux environment, as well as give you the basics of bash scripting and Python scripting. Both of those are important skills. So the whole idea was to give you the fundamental skills that you can use to move forward with your career in cybersecurity. You don't have to buy the book. You can just read our tutorials or watch our tutorials here on David's channel. 
I mean, I love what I love about the book, right? You said it. You said it, and I mean, this is the feedback people get. It's not overwhelming. I've got a bunch of Linux books here that are like that big and very, right. you know, the, like really in depth. So, like Linux Plus is is another cert from CompTIA that perhaps people could look at, um, but it's also wider than than hacking, right? Yeah, it's uh, the Linux Plus is more tuned towards uh, administration. Yeah. like the Red Hat Red Hat certifications are as well. And uh, we also just introduced a Linux Basics for Hackers certification on whitehathacker.com, which is our certification uh, website. So we have that. It basically is limited to the material that you'll find in the book. Right? So it's a certification that'll show that you have mastered the skills in the book. So that's also an option as well. Next on my list, is Wireshark, right? Yeah. Wireshark is something that everybody needs, no matter what you're doing in IT. If you don't have it, you really don't know what's going on in your network. So Wireshark yeah. is just one of those tools that gives, that visualizes what's going on on your network. So you can see and analyze what's going on on your network. So it's going to give you, it's going to take every packet and then give you all the details of every packet. So if you're doing, say, incident response, you can see what was taking place on your network. If you're a network engineer and you're having some problems with the, you can use Wireshark to basically analyze the network and figure out what's going on, what's going wrong. If you're a hacker, you know, you can, you can find different ways to create packets that, for instance, are not RFC compliant that might have a beneficial effect in your ability to get past firewalls or IDSs, what have you. So it's really a, one of those essential tools that I, I think everybody needs to have. And you've done a number of tutorials uh, on your channel, David. Yeah. Uh, I think Chris has been on here doing yep. a number of, he's a Wireshark expert. I also want to do a shout out to TCP dump, which is a, yeah. a similar tool, but it's a command line tool. And I have uh, tutorials in getting started becoming a master hacker on both of those tools, Wireshark and TCP dump. TCP dump can be really useful if you're trying to analyze, say, for instance, a remote machine that doesn't have a GUI, you know, that Wireshark will work only in a GUI environment. So if you're SSHing into a, a, a remote system and you want to analyze the traffic, TCP dump is probably what you're going to use. And it's built into almost all of the Linux distribution. So if you've got a machine in India or in Belarus, and you're trying to analyze what's going on in it, you can easily SSH into it and then pull up TCP dump and view the traffic that way. It's not as easy to use as Wireshark, but it allows you to do essentially the same thing once you learn how to use it that you can do it with Wireshark, but from a command line. I need to give a shout out to Chris Greer. Uh, Chris has, as you mentioned, done a bunch of videos on my channel, but he's got his own YouTube channel. And I mean, if you if you want to learn Wireshark, just go and subscribe to Chris's channel. He's got like a getting started with Wireshark series, which will take you through a whole bunch of stuff. He's also got a course on Udemy that he's done with me. So if you want like a structured course, you can get that. But otherwise, just go sub to his channel. Lots and lots and lots of Wireshark. Chris is the kind of guy who lives and breathes Wireshark. So go and learn Wireshark from him is my advice. Great. Sorry, I'll keep by the way. Go on. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, he's he knows his Wireshark. And, like crazy, uh, yeah. But I, I just want to, as a caveat, like I said, it's, I'm not requiring or saying people need to become a Wireshark expert, but you need to understand. You need to understand. Yeah, you need to understand the basics of how to use it. Chris is an expert. Chris, Chris knows he's he's one of the leading experts in Wireshark. If you don't know everything that Chris does, that doesn't mean that you're you you can't use Wireshark and you can't do cybersecurity, right? You need to understand the basics of what it, Wireshark can do and how I can create filters that are specific to what I'm trying to analyze. And that's probably the, the, the key um, skill set yeah. in Wireshark is how do I filter out all of those packets that are going by? There's thousands of packets going by every second, right? I don't want to see all of them. I want to see just some of them that, that might explain what's taking place on my network. And so creating those filters is the key part of Wireshark. Everything else is kind of boilerplate, but creating effective filters is what you want to be able to do. So study that filter stuff. There is a, a, a filter building 
a capability that's built into Wireshark. So you can go ahead and build your filters without, if you don't know anything about building filters, you can go ahead and they have a little pop-up window that'll open up and it shows you all of the fields that you can filter for. And then you can go ahead and, and extract that information that's key to your understanding of what's taking place on your network. I mean, you raise a good point there. So I, I just want to jump in there, if you don't mind. You you, oh. you made this point that as a hacker or cybersecurity professional, you don't need to uh, like go really, really deep into each of these topics, right? So you don't have to become like a CCIE like I am in networking. You can, as long as you've got base knowledge, that's you, you, like, what, what's the saying? You, a mile wide, inch deep kind of thing, right? <laughs> right. That's what people always say about the uh, CISSP exam, which uh, the CISSP is kind of like the, the top level exam certification in cybersecurity. And one of the criticisms that people give of it is that it's it's a mile wide and an inch deep. So you don't go into yeah. great depth into every place, but it's meant more for administrators in cybersecurity. It's a really valuable certification to have. You know, it's the, the salaries that it's going to generate for you. Money, money, money. Significant. You know, where you can make a good living with that certification. I think the two certifications, well, there's a number of certifications. In cybersecurity, the CCSP, which is the cloud security professional, and the CISSP are two of the most valuable certifications that you can get in that field. We have classes on both of those at Hackers Arise. Um, but moving on, okay, so you don't need to don't need to be an expert in any one of these fields, but you need to have a understanding of yeah. them. The next one I want to emphasize is virtualization. Okay. Yeah. I mean, 20 years ago, you know, virtualization was people were like, what the hell are you talking about? What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> now everything is virtualized, right? Our whole world is virtualized. Right? So for studying vulnerabilities in systems, studying malware, uh, you're going to want to virtualize it. If you're running a production environment and you have multiple servers, you want to virtualize them, right? It doesn't make any sense to have to buy separate physical hardware for multiple servers when you can put them all on one server and then virtualize them. So this is a skill set that's really valuable both in a production uh, environment of a network engineer, a uh, administrator, as well as cybersecurity. Right? You need to understand how these systems work. Now, of course, these systems have all their little quirks, and David and I were just talking a little while ago about yeah. one, of the, one of the quirks that, that uh, the virtualization systems have is that when you're working in SDRs, software-defined radios, that sometimes those USB-based devices don't communicate as well as they should through the USB port. And so these are things that you learn from playing with them and getting to know them, but you need to be familiar with them. If you go into a, a, a cybersecurity environment as a job and you don't know virtualization, you're gonna have trouble because people are virtualizing everything. And yeah. as a hacker, cybersecurity pro, there's a lot of things that I can do with virtualization that are gonna keep me safe, right? Because I can. I can attempt to hack in my own virtualized environment without getting into any kind of legal problems. If I'm analyzing malware, I want to take that malware and I want to put it into a virtualized, closed, sandboxed, I mean, it's a closed system where it can't infect anything else, right? So I can run a piece of malware in a virtualized, closed system so that it can't leave my system and I can analyze it within that environment. So there's so many uses of virtualization that you should be familiar with that. Oracle has VirtualBox. VirtualBox is a great piece of software. It has some limitations, but it's a great piece of software. It's free. VMware has VMware Workstation. They charge $150, $200. I think they have a student version discount. You can also get Player, that. which is free, but it's um, kind of it's crippled, but it's but at least it's free, yeah. And fl and player, right? Player that's free, yep. But I think VirtualBox would probably be better than Player. I used to always, I always used to recommend VMware, but it seems like you know VirtualBox. 
it, you got to see which one works best for you. I think you and I have had discussions about this as well, right? Sometimes VirtualBox is better. Sometimes VMware is better. Um, exactly. See what works we've, for you. And then we've, we found that VirtualBox actually worked better with SDRs, communicating yeah. with SDRs than VMware did. So that was kind of surprising. But because uh, usually I found that VMware works better in yeah. communication and networking. But in this case, that USB port on VMware has certain limitations in speed that, are, that really hampered our ability to do some of our SDR work. But Oracle VirtualBox, free, get it, It's learn it, become familiar with it. You don't have to be an expert, just know how it works, right? And you can use it for all kinds of interesting and cool stuff in uh, your studies of cyber security. What about Docker and that stuff? We're not talking about that, right? Well, we're not talking about Docker, but Docker is one of those things that's coming on quickly. And I use Docker a lot. And so Docker allows you to basically put all the dependencies into a virtualized system onside, inside your operating system. And there's a lot of advantages to doing that. So when I'm talking about virtualization, though, I'm really talking about these hypervisors of okay. Oracle and VMware. But Docker is something that you, you should become more and more aware. I do a number of tutorials on Hackers Rise using Docker. Uh, one of our interns just wrote a tutorial about Docker. It's on Hackers Rise right now. And he did a good job with that. And we'll have some more Docker tutorials coming up. So keep that in mind that uh, that's something that more and more people are using in the cybersecurity environment is just basically creating a and you can see, well, on my system right now, I've got several applications that are virtualized with Docker. Next. You're not sharing your screen, right? But that doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not sharing my screen, yeah, but we did, I was thinking about our previous video. You can yeah, see no, that's that fine. I, had, I had Docker on uh, some applications uh, on that yeah. system. So I'll just wrap it up. Sorry. So virtualization, more like in virtual machines and containers, you know, someone can learn about it later, like Docker being a container. That's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about virtualization here, but yeah, I think that Docker is one of the things that you need, those containers you need to start becoming familiar with. I wouldn't say right now it's essential, but I yeah. would say that it's something to keep your eye on. That's why we've we've added it to Hackers Rise. So you'll see it on the front page of Hackers Rise. There's a brief tutorial written there by um, one of our interns who, uh, who uses it, and all of us use it. Then security concepts and technologies is next on my list. And this is important that you understand certain concepts that are used throughout the cybersecurity environment, right? Things like PKI, public key infrastructure, things like hashing, things like cryptography, things like what is an IDS, you know, how does it work? Right? And these are things that are included in the CompTIA Security Plus certification. And I think that's a really valuable place to get you know, to, to get the skills and, and maybe get the certification. In a lot, in the U.S. at least, in a lot of government jobs that have anything to do with, with security, and that's pretty much everything, almost everything, it's a requirement to even sit down at a computer in most environments. They will not allow you to sit down at a computer without having the Security Plus certification. So um, sometimes they'll let you sit at a computer, but they'll give you six months to pass the certification. But these are this is good for anybody who's entering the field. Once again, the certification is going to show that, hey, I understand these concepts. And you might think that you know, these are simple things, but you know, there's a lot of stuff in there that you might not become familiar with, might not be familiar with, that it's useful to grab a book. Uh, we have a Security Plus video series that you can uh, purchase, and, and a lot of people have used it to pass that exam. That's another one. I think it's going to put you in the framework of understanding, knowing the terminology and concepts that are used throughout cybersecurity. And some of those may not be real familiar to you if you're coming from a different environment, even if you're coming from an IT environment that are real important in cybersecurity. Next, I'd like to suggest that people understand wireless technology. So when I talk about wireless technology, my first 
concern is we understand Wi-Fi or what's referred to as 802.11. That's the Wi-Fi that we use every day in accessing the internet. And it's important that you understand how they work, right? You don't need to be an expert, but understand the basics and how they're secured. And of course, once you understand how they're secured, you better understand how what makes them vulnerable and how you can hack them. If we think about the further out, there's an awful lot of wireless technology, radios, right? Everything is a radio, right? We don't think about this until the Flipper Zero came along, right? <laughs> I, I thought about it, but other people didn't think about it until the Flipper Zero came around. We, I started teaching SDR for hackers um, a few years ago, and I was really glad to see Flipper Zero came along because all of a sudden, because people up to that point were going, what is this? What is this stuff you're doing? Now people understand how important the security of these radio wireless technologies are. This includes Bluetooth, this includes your cell phone, it includes satellite communications, you know, your remote control. These are all wireless technologies. The key fob in entering your car, right? So that, that key fob is sitting in your pocket is communicating to your car that you're nearby and allows you to open the doors. Now that we know can be easily hacked. And that's one of the things that we also have in our SDR for Hackers class, as well as our car hacking class. So those are kind of foundational skills that I would like to see people do. If you came to me looking for a job and you didn't have those skills, I would go, mm, okay, you probably need to go back and study some more, right? So to be even like an entry level position in cybersecurity. Now to get to like an intermediate level, okay, I would like to see people have scripting skills. We talked a little bit at the beginning, bash scripting, Python scripting. Those are the two most important, okay? Our bash and Python. Bash is the bash shell in Linux, okay? The born again shell, B-A-S-H. It's used in almost every Linux distribution. And it basically allows you to run commands in a, in a simplest form, it allows you to run commands automatically, okay? You can set up jobs to do things automatically. That's the biggest use for bash scripting. Now, Python scripting is used for a lot of cybersecurity uh, applications. Right. Many of the tools that you'll see us use on this channel, those are Python tools. Most of them are. Now, some of them are Perl, and some of them are Ruby, and some of them are Go, but they still are a small minority of most of the tools. So if you want to write your own tools, become familiar with Python, okay? I have a Python Basics for Hackers videos as well as inside of Linux Basics for Hackers is a chapter on Python in getting started becoming a master hacker. And then I have a new class coming up in, I think it's April on Python Basics and Advanced Python uh, in at that time. This is one of those intermediate level skills that I'd like to see anybody who's applying to a job with me or other firms to have. The scripting, I think, is one of those kind of, yeah. you know, it's really an important skill to have. If you don't have it, you're going to be stuck using other people's scripts. And that's not, that's not always you know, useful. Um, oftentimes what I find myself doing is I'll have somebody else's script, but I'll have to edit. Yeah. Right? So I'm not creating necessarily something brand new, but I'm taking something that somebody's already written, I have a framework, and then I can edit it and, and add capabilities to it. So, you know, if you don't know your Python, you don't need to be an expert, but if you don't know your Python, you can't do that, right? So get to know Python, think about the future, about using some of the other scripting uh, languages. Go is being used more and more, and Rust is being used more and more in our industry. Perl used to be used a lot, um, less and less so. And Ruby is used a fair amount. And Metasploit, for instance, is all written in Ruby. And all the exploits in Metasploit are written in Ruby. So that's scripting. But if I could just summarize, know your bash, know your Python. The others, you can put those off into the future and learn those. But if you, do, if you come to me for a job and you don't know Python, that's going to be hard to hire you, okay? Next, 
is database skills. Databases, you know, for, from a hacker perspective, a database is the golden fleece of the hackers. You know, what a, what a hacker wants is the is the database, right? So, because that's where all the good stuff is at. That's the yeah. PII. That's the credit card numbers. That's so. If you're a hacker and you're trying to get into databases, you got to know how they work, right? And so that's one of those things that you need to become familiar with. Know some basic SQL, which is the language of databases. Become familiar with the major players. That's SQL Server from Microsoft, Oracle from Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, DB2. These are the major players. They all are relational databases. That means that they break up the data into tables. Now, we are getting more and more applications that are using things like MongoDB, which are no SQL databases. And so that's something that we're seeing you know, more and more big applications where it's talking about huge amounts of data are going to these no SQL databases. So that, I wouldn't say that's like a required skill, but something put on your agenda for the future to be able to understand how some of these other databases work. But for now, focus on SQL Server from Microsoft. The probably the, the most common database be, behind websites is MySQL. So if you were to start someplace, you can use MySQL. I have a little bit of MySQL in both Linux Basics for Hackers and in getting started becoming a master hacker. MySQL is built into Kali or to try to alleviate some confusion is that on Kali, in the older versions, they use MySQL. On the newer versions, they're using MariaDB. They're basically the same thing. So you know, there's small differences behind them, but if you were to type in MySQL on your Kali, it's going to pull up MariaDB. If you write in, type in MariaDB, it's going to pull up MariaDB. There's what happened is that the developers of MySQL sold it to Oracle from 20 years ago. And then what happened is that they had a no compete agreement for five years. And then after five years, they went and created a clone of MySQL called MariaDB. So don't get upset and don't get, you know, don't get confused by the fact that when you when you look at say Kali that it's using MariaDB. The same commands are going to work, the same structure is going to work, okay? But they're basically clones of each other. So that's learn a little bit of databases, right? Then you need to understand how web apps work, right? You need to understand how web app little bit of HTML, uh, some of the programming languages, okay, are going to be useful here, especially if you're trying to hack some of these, okay? Things like JavaScript is a good thing to understand. You don't be an expert, you don't be able to build your own website, just understand a little bit about how they work because once you understand how they work, then you're gonna be better at being able to compromise them or hack them. Compromise is another word for hacking. It yeah. sounds a little better. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the intermediate skills, you know, one of the things that I always emphasize for our people is forensics, digital forensics. If you're if you don't understand digital forensics, then you're not going to be able to keep yourself safe. Right? So the whole idea here is that you need to know what the forensic investigator knows so that you can stay safe. If you want to stay anonymous on the internet, right? you need to know what can people see? What can they learn about me to be able to hide your identity or to hide your activities? So we have just started a whole new program at Hackers Arise uh, on just digital forensics. So we have like 15 courses in this program of just digital forensics. We have coming up just in uh, this month is we have our first Bitcoin forensics class. So we'll be studying how you can trace Bitcoin. A lot of people have assumed up to this point that there are transactions on the dark web using Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are anonymous. And basically we're disputing that and saying, no, we can, we can trace your transactions and maybe even identify you 
Okay. And identifying is a little harder than tracing. Tracing is easy to do. Identifying, there's ways of identifying uh, individuals as well by analyzing the blockchain. And so we'll be doing that. Actually, it's coming up next week, but it's just, it'll be already over when, uh, when this video appears. And then a couple other areas that I think are important is cryptography. Okay. Cryptography is the ability to hide what we're communicating. G-U-R. Cryptography is the way that data traverses the internet and people can't read what we're doing, right? And so it's a way that we store passwords. And these are all the ways that, you know, there's so many ways that we use cryptography to secure our communications. And so if you're a network engineer, security engineer, you need to understand the basics of those. A lot of that is going to come from the Security Plus certification. We have a class on just what's called cryptography basics for hackers, um, where we go into a lot of the, the cryptography. We're not going to make you into a cryptographer. That's not our goal. But we're trying to make you familiar with the techniques, the terminology of cryptography so that you can be conversant on it and be able to secure it or break it. And then, I think this is the last one, and this is kind of a higher level skill, and that's reverse engineering. Right? Reverse engineering. This is maybe an advanced skill. And the idea here is that you can go in and take a piece of malware and then open it up and analyze it and understand what it's doing and maybe even change it and make it do something else or do something more. Among hackers, this is a common technique. So if you're in malware analysis, one of the things that you'll note is that there is malware gets used over and over and over again, right? Even by people like the NSA and Sandworm in, uh, in Russia, these are top hacking groups. They aren't necessarily going to reinvent the wheel. They're gonna take a piece of malware off the shelf and they're gonna make some edits to it. And you can do that if you have the reverse engineering skills. We have a reverse engineering course coming up in February. Uh, it's really, takes quite a while to become really um, adept at reverse engineering. But our first class is coming up in February where we'll show you the basics of reverse engineering and analyze some real malware and, and show you how it works. And then I'd like to throw in a couple other, what are called, I call non-tangible skills or intangible skills. And this is something that I find oftentimes separates the people who are successful from those who are not. And you can have all of those skills, but if you don't have these intangible skills, you're probably not gonna be successful. And the first one I wanna put in that category is persistence. <laughs> you, you, you gotta keep at it, right? You, if you fail once, you go at it again. And if you fail twice, you go at it again. If you fail three times, you go at it again. You don't give up. You keep at it, no matter what that is. In our field as hackers, I think it's really important, but it also applies to just about any field that you're in, is persistence. One of the key attributes of people who are successful versus those who are not is persistence. The people who don't give up are the people who end up being successful. If you're a hacker, you know, oftentimes, unlike the YouTube and I'm not going to knock YouTube. The TikTok videos, unlike the TikTok <laughs> videos, it's not going to work every time. It's not going to work in 30 seconds. It might take you 30 days. It might take you 30 months, right? Yeah. And the key is to not give up, right? So that's one that's really important that I think is overlooked. Yeah. And then the next one on that, on that uh, intangible skills is problem solving, right? So, you know, here as a hacker, you're trying to figure out how to get an application or an, op or an operating system to do things that it wasn't designed to do. So the first thing you need to do is understand how that application works 
and then how to break it, right? And that takes a, a, a what I call problem solving skills. Some people might call them analytical skills. You know, basically it's solving problems. You know, this can be, these are skills that can be developed in a lot of different fields. Um, you know, it's, I found that, for instance, um, puzzle, people who do puzzles oftentimes are very good at problem solving because doing a puzzle is a problem solving. It's just basically breaking down a problem to its pieces and then methodically going through potential solutions. One of the things that's frustrating to me is seeing people who can't make an attempt and then figure out that that didn't work. So what's the next step? And that didn't work. And what's the next step? And oftentimes they'll go, people without good problems will end up repeating the same steps over and over again without eliminating possibilities. That's key. If you try something that didn't work, you say, okay, this means that this doesn't work that way. Eliminate that approach. Now, try this approach. Okay, that didn't work. That means that this application doesn't work that way. And start discarding all those possibilities until you've narrowed it down to just a few possibilities that you can focus on that might work. So that's what I call problem solving or analytical skills. And then the last one is think creatively, right? If you're the kind of person who can only do things um, by meant by cookbook, right? Like <laughs> there's there's a number of of uh, books on the market that call themselves cookbooks, right? And they take you step by step by step by step. Well, that's great in some applications, but as a hacker, you don't have necessarily a cookbook. You have to think creatively of ways that you can possibly get this particular task done. And it may not be in any book, any place. You know, that's, you know, nobody can write all the possibilities, write, write a book about all the possibilities. You have to be able to think creatively. Some people call it thinking outside the box. It's a way overused term, but that's really what I'm talking about. And some of the most successful hackers, and for that matter, some of the most successful people are people who can think creatively, right? It's not... I think it's different than intelligence. I think it really is, because I think intelligence is more linked to problem solving. Here, this is like thinking of ways that nobody has really thought of before. I mean, I this, this may be a controversial thing to say, but Albert Einstein is considered to be this great genius right, in, in the 20th century. But what he really had was an imagination. He had he imagined the way the world worked. He imagined it without doing any experiments, right? So normally a scientist does experiments. They have a hypothesis and they do experiments yeah. and they go, "Oh, this is the way it this is the way it really works." He didn't have that. He just imagined it. He imagined the way the world worked, and then he wrote it down, and then tried to prove it mathematically, and it wasn't until decades later that somebody proved him right, right? So he didn't follow the scientific method. He imagined the way the world worked and was very convinced that that's the way the world worked. And then people later on proved, and now he's considered a great genius. I, I don't want to in any way, shape, or form denigrate Albert Einstein, but think of Think of what he was doing, and nobody else was thinking that way a hundred years ago. This is only a hundred years ago, right? If I, I, when you take a long, long view of history, a hundred years is nothing, yep. right? It's yes, just, exactly. it's, it's just a couple. It's one lifetime, right? Yep. And uh, it's nobody was thinking this way, and he said, "This is the way the world. This is the way the world works." It wasn't necessarily a, a, a. a result of his intelligence, it was a result of his creative thinking, you know, his imagination. And with that, I think that kind of sums up what I think is the, my roadmap to becoming a master hack. I love it. I, I've got some questions. Um, I think for 2024, what do you think 
I should focus on if I'm new? Or like what's hot or which wave should I ride? Um, AI is all the rage at the moment. Um, is there any specific area? Sorry, go on. No, AI is, uh, is something that everybody needs to be, and I probably should have included it in here. Um, but AI is going to change the way all of us work, right? Yeah. If you're on a help desk, right, you, you can use AI to be able to analyze the problems that come into you. So even at that level, AI can help you. And AI can write really nice answers <laughs> to your help desk questions and save you a lot of time. Now, that's going to be good to your employer because you're going to spend, you could be able to answer more questions by using AI, okay? AI is capable now of writing some good scripts, right? So if you've used it for scripting, you'll find that it does a pretty good job of writing scripts, but oftentimes the scripts will have small errors in them, and that's why you have to know a little bit of your Python. You can use AI to write the script and write you know, most of the code, but it's, oftentimes there'll be small errors in it that you have to be able to fix yourself. So I, yeah, I would say that play around with ChatGPT and some of the others so you become familiar with what they can do and what they can't do. But it can make you a lot more productive. And that's the key to your employer. Your employer wants you to be as productive as possible, right? And so use whatever tools are available to you. I can still remember, you know, 20 years ago or more where people would say, you know, you looked up the code on Google. You, you Googled how to do that script, right? And that's That's cheating. You're like, no, that's being productive. That's exactly. being efficient. That's being efficient, right? But there were people who were saying that now we'd all take that for granted, right? But that's the same thing, is that you're using the tools that are available to you to be more efficient and get the job done more effectively and quicker than you would without them. I think AI is just going to change everything. Uh, and it's growing it at is. such a rapid rate. There's always a new product being released. I mean, Google have just released a new one now, Gemini, I think. So it's um, at the time of this recording. So it's like, I think if I was young, I don't know if you agree, but if I was, if I was starting out, AI would be like a big focus of mine. I think it has to be. I think it has yeah. to be. I think we all think no matter what your age is, you need yeah. to be familiar with AI because oh, yeah. it's, if you're old, it's gonna, it's going, you need to be familiar with it to be able to keep up with the younger people who are, you know, who are be using it and are gonna be much more productive. If you're young, it's a way to break in and show yeah. that you can use these tools. And that's what they are. They're just tools for us to be able to do our job effectively and efficiently. I think it's, it's like you said about Python. There's a huge split, if you like, between someone who knows a, a language, a programming language like Python, and someone who doesn't. Someone who knows that programming language or knows how to code, it just puts you in a different league. Uh, it gives you, gives you so many advantages. It does. Yeah, the, the basic scripting skills of, of Python are really, for for me as an employer, yeah. you know, it's, it's a requirement that you be able to do some basic scripting in Python because there's so many things that we do that require Python skills. I think AI is becoming, is gonna be like that if it's not already becoming like that. If you don't know how to use leverage AI, you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage. I agree. Okay, by the way, as always, I really wanna thank you. This is great. I really appreciate you sharing. Um, I really appreciate that you don't, you know, just give us like fluff, but you give us a proper roadmap. Um, and, you know, with all your years of experience, you, you, you're helping the next generation or people who are trying to break into this field. Uh, give them a proper roadmap. And I think it's what's really nice about what you've done this time, which I really appreciate, is you're not just talking about like red teaming or hacking. You're also looking at like network engineers. You're looking at people on, you know, on the blue team or trying to protect. And there's so many opportunities in cyber. It's not just like try and be a pen tester or be a hacker. There's a whole bunch of opportunities on on the blue teaming or protecting side. And I mean, these skills are, are just valid on both sides. Exactly, yeah. Blue teams, you know, we we train both blue team and red yeah. team. And there's so many more jobs on the blue team. So, you know, if you're entering this field and you don't feel comfortable as a hacker, penetration tester, you don't never mastered it, boy, there's a lot of jobs on blue teams. And sometimes the blue teamers are getting paid more than the red yeah. teamers are, right? Because yep. the blue teamers are protecting the company's crown jewels, right? Yep. And so that's where you know a good company is gonna put their energy and money 
into protecting the crown jewels. And that's what you as a blue team are doing. That's brilliant. Occupy the web, I really look forward to our next video. So for everyone who's watching, comments, please put comments below the kind of things that you want me to ask Occupy the Web and the kind of videos you want us to create. We've got a lot of ideas, but it's always great to hear from the community. So please put your comments below. OTW, thanks so much. Thanks, David. I always enjoy our little chats.